Okay, um, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to dig uh, even deeper into ordinary least squares. Um, we're going to review the properties uh, that we have previously discussed, and then we're going to discuss some important uh, sort of statistical assumptions that we end up making uh, about ordinary least squares that if those assumptions hold, um, would imply that ordinary least squares is perhaps the best estimator um, for linear relationships between variables that uh, potentially have joint variability, uh, whether that's um, uh, correlational or whether that's causal. Um, later on, we'll discuss how we take linear regression and we make it, or try to make it rather, causal, which is a little bit distinct from just sort of running regression. Even, even though, as I've mentioned in class, the point of running regressions is to make causal statements, ultimately, uh, we have to think about a lot of things in order to ultimately feel good about those particular causal statements, where if we run a regression, we find cor correlation uh, between two variables, we feel confident that that correlation exists. The question then is, does it rise to the level of, of causation? And again, we'll have statistical ways um, that we think about that. Um, so just to kind of briefly uh, sort of remind you, what exactly does ordinary least squares does? Um, ordinary least squares uh, is an attempt um, to estimate population uh, coefficient. Uh, so this is the population equation. Uh, population y uh, is equal to, and then this is just you know uh, some function of x, uh, beta one or b one rather here being the function of x, b one being the population marginal effect of x on y. Um, B naught here is just the slope, uh, the intercept, and then uh, U here uh, is the error term. Um, and then what we use is we use observational data. So this is the actual regression that we run. Um, so YI uh, is uh, the ith observation from a sample of Y. Um, the same thing with XI. This is uh, the ith uh, observation uh, from a sample of X. Um, now. The residual here, uh, UI, this is this is not observed data. Um, this residual stems uh, primarily from the estimation of uh, the beta one parameter. And again, just keep in mind that when we estimate the beta one parameter using ordinary least squares, what we are attempting to do is estimate the, the B1 parameter. That is that population marginal effect. So we're gonna use samples of observed data to estimate population marginal effects uh, between two variables. Uh, here, those variables are just x and y. Um, and the way that ordinary least squares does this is that it, it picks values of beta 1 and beta naught such that two conditions uh, are met. Um, first off, the covariance between our independent variable x and our error term uh, is uh, zero. That means that there's no underlying systematic relationship between our independent variable X and the residuals uh, that would be produced from the estimation. Uh, the second condition um, is that the expected value um, of the regression model, that is the uh, sample Y minus the right-hand side of the equation, right? You notice we're just taking Y here and we're subtracting off this. Um, that the expected value of that is going to be zero. Um, now, the point that this makes really is that the expected value of UI is zero. That's really important for us. Um, residuals and, and error terms are supposed to be what we call white noise. Um, they're not supposed to have any statistical effect. They're not supposed to have any statistical weight to them. And so the estimated, or I should say the expected value of our, our uh, residuals um, is going to be uh, zero. Um, that's gonna, gonna be a condition um, that the ordinary squares create. So ordinary squares creates these conditions when it selects beta one uh, and beta naught. And then in, in addition to that, the, the way in which ordinary squares picks uh, beta one and beta naught is it does so um, in an attempt to minimize the sum of those squared residuals. So the residual, just to remind you, um, is the distance from an observed value of y minus the estimated 
uh, value of y. In other words, where we expect y to be after we've estimated beta one and beta naught, right? So we use samples of data of x and y to run linear regressions. And when we run those linear regressions, the way the math works out is that there's all these potential values of beta one and beta naught, right? So if we just look at this in the context of an actual line like this, right? Remember beta naught is just the uh, slope, uh, the intercept here, the vertical intercept. And then beta um, one hat uh, is the slope of this particular line. So you can imagine that there's all these different lines that can be fitted um, in this particular data. In each of these lines, I'll just draw some, some random ones here. Um, each of these lines uh, would have a different slope, uh, uh, of a different um, intercept, and uh, would also have a different slope. So you can just see all these different lines we could fit to these data. You know, this one has a really low intercept. Maybe this one has a really high intercept, something like this, right? There's all these different lines that could be fitted to these data. Ordinarily squares picks the line that minimizes the sum of squared residuals. And it just so happens to be the case that the estimator that achieves this um, is simply the covariance in uh, between x and y divided by the variance of x. In other words, what we're saying here is that the goal of ordinary least squares is to pick the line which minimizes the sum of squared residuals. Okay, so let me get rid of all this stuff. All right, so there's all these distances, right? So the, these dots represent the observed values of y relative to the observed values of x, okay? And then the distance from this point here, the vertical distance, that's the, the deviation of the observation of Y from where we expect it to be for this particular level of X, right? We see it right here. This is the observation YI. This is the value of X, XI. Uh, this is where we actually see YI. And then this is where we expect uh, to see YI for this level of X. And so the, the difference here is that residual. And so what ordinary squares does is it minimizes the sum of squared residuals. In other words, it picks beta naught and beta one such that the line that it produces has the smallest sum of squared residuals. In other words, there's no other way to draw a line and have a smaller sum of squared residuals. That's what ordinary least squares does, okay? And like I said, it just so happens to be the case that the estimator that we can use that achieves this, um, as we see here, uh, beta hat OLS, is just the covariance in, uh, between X and Y divided by the variance of X. In other words, if we have two variables and if we take the covariance between them and we divide it by the variance of the independent variable, in this case, X, that that estimation of beta hat, and, and again, realize this is the estimation of the marginal effect of X and Y. That this estimation of marginal effect of X and Y, so we would call this the OLS estimate of the coefficient between X and Y. So this is an estimator. And so this estimator covariance in X uh, between X and Y divided by the variance of X minimizes the sum of squared residuals. So that beta hat OLS with the covariance in X and Y divided by the variance of X achieves the minimization of the sum of squared residuals. So therefore, when we run linear regressions, uh, and again, if, if uh, some certain assumptions hold and everything, um, then that beta hat OLS that you see there, that is the best estimator of the linear relationship between X and Y. In fact, there's gonna be this concept that we discuss uh, often with ordinarily squares, and that is that when certain assumptions hold, um, ordinarily squares is blue. What do we mean by that? We mean best linear unbiased estimator. Best linear unbiased estimator. So again, the, the assumptions and the properties that we're going to talk about in just a moment, if those hold, then the covariance in X between X and Y divided by the variance in X is the best linear unbiased estimator 
<laughs> Oop, can't type of the marginal effect of x. Okay, so what are those properties uh, and assumptions? Okay, we've already talked about a couple of these in class. Um, the first assumption just says that if you sum all of our residuals, um, that the, the summation uh, is, is zero. Um, all this means is that the line that is fit by ordinarily squares has the same residual weight above and below. So in other words, if you added up all these residuals above the line, you subtracted off the residuals below the line, but you would get zero. And that's true of every linear regression line. So when ordinarily squares fits a line, that line will necessarily have the same residual weight above and below the line. So that, that's a, a, an artifact of the way in which ordinarily squares works. So this is, this is more of a property than an assumption. Um, I, I call this ordinarily squares assumption, but that's really a property that, that when you run a regression, the resultant line that is being fit. And, and again, remember, that all when we say line, really all we mean is there's the beta knot, the, the intercept, uh, and then there's the slope. And that's really all we need for the line, right? That's, you know, y equals mx plus b. You guys remember that from, you know, uh, your first time you ever saw uh, algebra. And so, you know, y equals mx plus b. m is the slope of that line. b is the intercept. And that's the only thing you need. Then you have values of x and y, and you can actually write the line down. Um, X and uh, Y are IID, that means independently identically distributed, and that's for all observations of I, that's what this little thing here means. This means for all I. It just means that um, our data is uh, distributed in such a way that lacks any sort of underlying systemic um, sort of uh, relationships. Um, so independently identically distributed. Um, that will be something that later on we have to sort of deal with from a sampling perspective. Uh, and that also heightens the importance of good sampling uh, as well. Uh, and then the last assumption is a uh, property is that outliers of X and Y are, are statistically unlikely. Um, and why that matters is that if outliers of X and Y are statistically unlikely, um, then that would imply that we are not likely to see them very often. Um, and more importantly than that, if we do happen to see outliers, uh, in order for us to, to be able to run a good regression uh, and to feel good about it, we may uh, want to kick out the, those outliers. Now, again, as I've mentioned a lot this semester, you want to be careful with outliers. Uh, kicking them out has to be something that you take with great care. And you really have to make sure that th these are truly outliers. And, and we'll talk uh, a little bit later about you know, how we can sort of make that determination. Okay, so the rest of what we'll talk about are more like assumptions regarding the underlying statistics of ordinarily squares, and there's some really important stuff in here. So the first one, um, uh, as we've already mentioned, uh, is that our betas are population estimates. So we're not, when we run a regression, we're not estimating a sample coefficient uh, of, of the effect of X on Y, we're estimating the population coefficient. You got to keep that in mind, right? There's a reason why we go through and we, we use the central limit theorem and the law of large numbers um, because those tell us that uh, as sample size goes up, then our, pop, our, our sample parameters are going to converge onto our population parameters. Again, ultimately what we are interested in in linear regression is the estimation of population parameters, um, population coefficients. Um, but we use samples to get there. And again, this is why we've spent all this time this semester talking about sampling and, and the relationship between populations and samples, because ultimately the tension that exists between population and samples lies at the heart of, of ordinarily squares regression. Uh, we have a random sample of size n. That is simply that the sample that we have is, is a random sample. Now this gets a little bit tricky um, depending upon the type of observational data that you're using. Uh, certainly sometimes we sort of uh, stretch uh, or elongate rather the definition of what we mean by random. Um, the key to random sampling in the context of observational data is just uh, you as the researcher um, want to try as hard as possible to not pick uh, any specific observation. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say that you wanted to do a study and you're interested in looking at, you know, uh, city policies towards um, biking, 
So you wanted to see like um, if city policies toward biking uh, increased or decreased uh, vehicular deaths from bikes, like people being killed by, by uh, uh, cars um, as they're riding their bike. Um, and let's say that um, you start out and you say, okay, I'm going to pick the 10 biggest cities. Well, okay, like the problem there is that it's not really a random sample. You're picking the 10 biggest cities. And it could be the case that the 10 biggest cities have something specific about them that makes that sample non-random uh, for your particular statistical purposes. Now, on the other hand, you know, say I'm picking the 10 biggest cities, that also can be an appropriate way um, to put together a sample. Uh, it really just depends upon sort of the nature of the question. Um, and also, uh, if, if we're looking at like cities, for example, um, you know, are you looking at this data over time or is this just simply a cross-sectional sample? Uh, that stuff matters as well. Um, you know, if I have the 10 largest cities uh, in just one year, that kind of feels non-random. But if I have the 10 largest cities over say 10 years, in which case um, there are different cities in that top 10, right? There some people, some cities may be in that you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 range may drop out uh, and other cities, you know, kind of fill in and take their place. Some cities are growing, some cities are, are declining in population. So if I track cities over a 10 year period, then selecting the 10 biggest cities, uh, given the fact that those 10 biggest cities actually changes over time, that would make it a little bit more random than if I just pick the, the 10 biggest cities. Um, this is a determination that you as the researcher have to make. Uh, is your sample uh, sort of random enough? Um, and, you know, if there are things that you can do sometimes to take a non-random sample and you can resample as, as we've looked at previously in class this semester, and you can take kind of a non-random sample and at least get it to have some particular statistical properties that are useful to us. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're hoping to do is to always collect samples, again, that, that are random. Uh, we need variance uh, in X, um, and, and we also need variance in Y too, but that, you know, we need X to change in some way. Um, and then we need Y to change in some way. And then I guess, of course, what we're doing is we're estimating the extent to which, you know, Y changes relative uh, to, to changes in X. This is perhaps the most important um, assumption that we, that we have to make with ordinary least squares. I mean, this is a lot hinges on this particular assumption. If you look at almost everything we've talked about thus far, um, the first three are just properties of the ordinary least squares regression. Um, the first three of the statistical properties here um, are, are pretty straightforward, make a lot of sense. Here, uh, this is called the zero conditional mean assumption. And the zero conditional mean assumption says that the expected value of our error term uh, conditional on uh, X is zero meaning that our error term has no systemic relationship uh, with X. Now we've already covered this a little bit when we talked about the covariance of X and Y um, equaling zero, um, but this is a little bit different. This is the conditional mean assumption. And so the, the expected value of the error term conditional on values of X is always equal to zero. That means that as X increases or as X decreases, our expected value for the residual uh, or for the error term rather, stays exactly the same. So the error terms, the, the residuals and the subsequent error terms don't get bigger or smaller based upon the level of X, okay? So that's what the zero conditional mean assumption is. Now, why, why is that so important? Well, if you go back and you look at this line for a second, what we're saying uh, is that the value of these residuals has nothing to do with the value of X. So the residuals aren't getting bigger, they're not getting smaller, um, they're, they're, you know, there's no systemic relationship between the size of the residuals uh, and the level of X. Why does that matter? Well, that matters because if there is some sort of systemic relationship between the residuals uh, and X, like, like for example, let's say the residuals are getting bigger as X gets bigger, then what that means is that the, the line being estimated in small values of X and the line being estimated for large values of X, while we're gonna estimate it to be the same, it would actually imply that there's a distinction. In other words, that the relationship between X and Y changes as X changes. Not simply that Y changes as X changes, but that the relationship between X and Y changes 
um, as X changes. And that would imply, uh, at, at the very least, a nonlinear relationship. Um, now, later on, we'll, we'll show how we can accommodate nonlinear relationships using uh, ordinarily squares. It's actually fairly straightforward. Um, those wouldn't be linear regressions. It would be nonlinear regressions, but that, that's something we can do. So again, oftentimes, if we have a problem, a statistical issue, like a violation of zero, zero conditional mean assumption, there might be things that we can do statistically to, to deal with that. Um, but it's really important for us to, to sort of assume that there's no systemic relationship between the size of our residuals uh, and the, the size of X. Um, and then the last sort of point, uh, one that, that we end up talking a lot about um, is just the homoscedasticity. Um, and that says that the variance uh, between U and X uh, is simply equal to the standard deviation. Um, now, what that means is that the variance of U and X is constant. Uh, it, it doesn't grow, it doesn't get bigger. It's very similar to the zero conditional mean assumption, although it's a, sort of a little bit of a, of a more distinct thing. So this zero conditional mean assumption has more to do with the relationship between X and Y. Um, whereas this uh, zero conditional mean assumption, or sorry, this assumption rather, uh, has more to do with the relationship between X and the error terms. Um, so this uh, zero conditional mean assumption basically says that when we see changes in X and, and then therefore see changes in Y, if we have the zero conditional mean assumption, this means no other thing, I guess, uh, for, for lack of a better term, um, is also affecting Y, which would then cause the residuals to have a, a non-zero conditional mean. So basically what the, the sort of zero conditional mean assumption says is that there's no other factors affecting uh, X, uh, Y. And so the only thing affecting Y is X, and therefore the expected value of the residuals related to values of X uh, is zero. Uh, whereas homoscedasticity has more to do with the actual relationship between X and U. And again, it goes back to that idea that the spread of the error terms is not affected by the value uh, of X. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. So I'm just going to bring up uh, the California school data uh, that we've been using um, all semester. Um, I'm going to uh, scatter, or let's do a... Uh, um, Let's do a scatter. Uh, and fit a line. <clears throat> so this is just test score and student teacher ratio. This is the, the question we've kind of been asking uh, a lot this semester. Does student teacher ratio affect, have a causal relationship on the test scores um, of California uh, elementary school students? Um, and so when we fit that line, um, what we look what we see here is, a, 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 you know, a generally negative relationship, which is sort of what we would probably assume uh, to be the case uh, between uh, student teacher ratio and um, test scores. Um, so what we mean uh, by the zero conditional mean assumption is that the expected level of the residuals relative to X is zero meaning that this linear relationship is produced by X's marginal effect on Y and nothing else. Um, later on, we'll refer the zero conditional mean assumption as having a lot to do with what we call omitted variable bias. So omitted variable bias means if something affects the relationship between X and Y and we don't include it in our regression model, then we have omitted variable bias. That's going to bias the estimation of the slope. And so what the, the zero conditional mean assumption basically means is that if there are other variables that affect the relationship between X and Y, then the slope estimate here is going to be biased uh, in some particular direction. So in other words, here we've estimated the relationship between student teacher ratio and test scores amongst California schools. If it were the case that other factors are involved in this underlying causal relationship, then the simple univariate linear regression of the effect of student-teacher ratio on test scores, uh, that, that slope coefficient is going to be biased. And obviously, if we have a biased slope coefficient, that's no good for us. Biased slope coefficients uh, are, are, are not a good thing. So that zero conditional mean assumption is really important. 
And, and I think the easiest way to think about the zero conditional mean assumption is it's essentially the no omitted variables assumption. Okay. Um, and obviously with univariate models, we, we likely violate that no, um, uh, no omitted variables uh, assumption. Uh, now, on the last um, point, um, the homoscedasticity point, um, this just says the variance between u and x uh, is equal to just some standard deviation, which is constant. That standard deviation is constant across uh, values of x. So what does that mean? Well, if we were to, um, let me just get the annotation here. This one here. So, if we were to draw distributions of error terms, or I'm sorry, of, of residuals like this, homoscedasticity means that the distributions here are the same. Now, I'm not drawing these very great, but I want you to imagine that these distributions are the same. Uh, and when I say distributions are the same, I mean they have the same standard deviation. So that zero conditional mean assumption uh, that, that we were talking about, I'm sorry, <laughs> rather the, the variance between u and x uh, equaling zero just means that the standard deviation of the spread of our residuals is uh, constant. It doesn't change as the value um, of x changes. Uh, sometimes though, um, that's not the case. Um, sometimes uh, we have situations in which the, the spread of our residuals seems to have some relationship uh, with the, the level of X, right? And if you just look at this, you kind of see that here, like the spread of the residuals seems to be much larger here. And then as we increase X, the spread becomes smaller. So if I were to sort of just kind of draw a distribution here, I think it's fairly kind of clear that the distributions get smaller as we go along. And then get really small here at the end. So this would violate, most likely violate homoscedasticity. Now we're going to test for it here in just a second. But the idea would be that the, the spread of the residuals as X increases change. In this case, they seem to get smaller. Um, the observations between test score and, and student-teacher ratio seem to get smaller as student-teacher ratio increases, which likely makes sense. Um, you know, as we go from, you know, very few students in a classroom to very, to a lot of students, there's sort of a normalization of test scores. Um, student teacher ratio probably starts to matter more. Um, and that's why we see the, those, those residual spreads um, decline. So if we have this, this is called heteroscedasticity. And if we have heteroscedasticity, then it, it's a statistical problem. But again, it's a statistical problem. Um, that that we have, we know what to do with. We we know how to deal with it. Now, we can test um, for those last two properties, um, statistically speaking. Um, so the last two properties here, um, the zero conditional mean assumption and homoscedasticity, we can test for these, um, and so we can know if these are problems. And this is a, a really important part of doing research and and doing linear regression is that we know our models are imperfect and we know that there's all these potential statistical problems that we could run into. Um, but we have statistical things that we can do to deal with that. So it's important for us to first identify that they're a problem, then know what we need to do to, to deal with them as, as statistical problems uh, and then do those things. Um, and then sort of what we typically do is we kind of look at the results before we fix the statistical issues and the results after we fix the statistical issues and, and we sort of compare them. That's, that's very often what we do. So let's go back to um, our, our California school data. And then let's just run a simple regression um, between test score and STR, student teacher ratio. And so we run that regression and we get um, a slope coefficient of negative 2.2. This says for every one unit increase in student teacher ratio, uh, test score declines uh, by 2.28 or 2.27, you know, whatever. Um, and we see that the t-statistic is negative 4.75. So uh, we have strong statistical significance. Uh, we see that backed up by the, the p-value of zero. Um, now, um, let's say that we're concerned uh, about uh, we might have heteroscedasticity, right? We just looked at the scatter. 
the scatter, you know, looks like maybe we have some heteroscedasticity, um, but I can test for this. Um, so immediately after running um, that regression, um, what I can do is I can do uh, IM test. And if I do that, what I will do is I will get three tests, basically. Um, a test for heteroscedasticity, that's what we care about the most, and then also tests for skewness and kurtosis. We, we don't care about them really at all. What we care about is, is the heteroscedasticity test. And here you'll see um, that we have a, a p-value. So this is the probability uh, that we reject the null. And so we can see here that this is below uh, 0 0.05. And so this is pretty good evidence that um, we can reject the null. Now, the important point is to know what the null is. And the null uh, of the heteroscedasticity test is that we have homoscedasticity. So the null hypothesis of the heteroscedasticity test is that there is homoscedasticity. So in other words, there is no statistical problems caused by the spread of your residuals rel related to the value of X. They're constant. Okay, that's the, the null hypothesis. But here we see a p-value less than 0 0.05. So at the 95% confidence level, the 5% significance level, we can reject the null hypothesis. Uh, and that means uh, that we have heteroscedasticity. Um, also, we can just look at this uh, chi statistic. Um, for heteroscedasticity, chi statistics above like seven or eight typically implies uh, we have heteroscedasticity. Um, and so what do we do with that? What do we do if we have heteroscedasticity? Well, the, really the only thing we can do is we can do something called robust standard errors. Um, so reg test score on STR and then VCE cluster. Now we're gonna, what we do, we're gonna, uh, what we call cluster our standard errors or robust clustered standard errors. And we're gonna cluster them at a particular level. Um, here we actually have an option. We could cluster them at the county level or we can cluster them at the district level. We would kind of have to, as researchers, decide which one we thought was the appropriate cluster. Typically, you cluster at the smallest aggregation level. So since our regressions are based off district levels, um, we can just uh, cluster at the district level. And so we're going to run this regression, clustering at the district level. And what this produces is uh, robust standard errors. You'll notice here that instead of just saying standard error, uh, it says robust standard error. Um, now, you'll notice that the coefficient estimate is identical, okay? The presence of heteroscedasticity does not bias our coefficient estimates. It's really important for us to know that. The presence of heteroscedasticity does not bias our coefficient estimate. But what it does do is it causes an underestimation of the standard error. So you'll notice the robust standard error, error here, 0.51, um, is greater than the initial standard error of 0.47. So basically, the presence of heteroscedasticity causes us to underestimate the, the standard error. So when we estimate it in a robust fashion, um, we, we feel a little bit more secure. We feel a little bit less skeptical um, of these results. Uh, we still have a, a T statistic greater than two. Um, it's four, in fact, it's very high statistical significance. And so in this case, we've dealt with the heteroscedasticity um, by, by using robust standard errors. We still have statistical significance. So what we've done here is we've put our statistical significance up to a little bit of additional statistical rigor. And we found that indeed it holds up, right? At least in, in the linear univariate regression uh, that, we're, that we're using here, right? So again, heteroscedasticity can be tested for. Uh, you can test it with just doing the, the IM test or what's called Cameron Trivedi's decomposition. Um, the, the test for heteroscedasticity, uh, the null is that we have homoscedasticity. And so a p-value less than 0 0.05 would allow us to reject the null. If we reject the null, that means we have heteroscedasticity. And then if we have heteroscedasticity, we want to cluster our standard errors. We want to do robust standard errors. And we'll do a lot of discussions later on about the nature of clustering. And, and you know, it, it becomes an important point, uh, in fact, later on, more important than, than you might think. Okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, let's, let's talk about the zero uh, conditional mean assumption. 